Hello everyone, it's Rev Julia here and I've just been reflecting with Paul, my husband, that the last time we were both in a precious gathering of Christians together was in that hotel in Bournemouth on the churches together in Allsford weekend away, two weeks ago today. We didn't know then, but it has proved to be the last time for a long time that we would gather for worship in person. At that weekend, the Reverend Ruth Fry of the Methodist Church shared with us a beautiful prayer written by David Adam, who was once vicar of Holy Island. It's about the tide. Many of us went down to the sea during that weekend in Bournemouth, and now it turns out to be particularly appropriate as we pray and wait for the tide of this pandemic to turn. Lord, I wait for the tide to turn until the distant becomes close, until the far off becomes near until the outside is within, until the ebb flows. Lord, I wait for the tide to turn until weakness is made strong, until blindness turns to sight, until the fractured is made whole, until the ebb flows. Lord, I wait until the tide turns, until the ordinary becomes strange, until the empty is presence full, until the two become one until the ebb flows. Amen. I feel that the prayer was written about God and feeling distant from him and wanting that to change so that the writer would feel God's presence once again. But as poetry often does, it now feels like it was written for this moment for the world. Our daughter Rachel is going to read it one stanza at a time and then I'll reflect briefly on what each stanza might mean to us. Lord, I wait for the tide to turn until the distant becomes close, until the far off becomes near, until the outside is within until the ebb flows. The first stanza then talks of a tide and for us and for the whole world in fact we are experiencing what hospitals have referred to as a tsunami, a tidal wave. Politicians and reporters have again referred to the tide turning and what we must do in order to turn the tide. The stanza also speaks of things that are distant coming close again. We of course know all about social distancing by now. The distance is so unnatural to us and so painful not to have been able to hug loved ones even if we're standing looking at them two metres away. And for us Brits, it's so hard not to shake hands. Though I'm sure that some of you were secretly relieved that first time the sharing of the peace got banned in church. And then it refers to the outside and inside. 
We yearn for those that have to stay outside of our homes, outside of our gates or garden fences, to be able to be invited in once more. And this is nowhere more poignant than when I think of all of us having to be outside of our church that we normally gather in, that we might soon be within it and together instead. And yet, I want to suggest that we don't wallow too much in that loss for our own sake, but allow it to turn our prayers away from ourselves and toward the persecuted churches across the world. Organisations such as Open Doors or Christian Solidarity Worldwide tell of many horror stories of Christians who have no churches, whose homes are attacked, who are punished severely or killed for their faith, and not for three or twelve weeks, but today, yesterday, and for years gone by. Yet their plight rarely makes the headlines. So let's not forget them in our prayers, even when the tide has turned on this pandemic. Lord, I wait for the tide to turn until weakness is made strong, until blindness turns to sight, until the fractured is made whole, until the ebb flows. And so the second stanza mentions weakness, being made strong, a wonderful theme of the New Testament. In our weakness is God's strength. When we are weak, we can be strong in God. And I'm sure you and I know people who have contracted the coronavirus and speak of such a great weakness in muscles and bones and breathing and indeed in their spirits. And we long for them to be made strong again. There's a reference to to blindness turning to sight. And how hard is this sort of blindness that we're in now where we cannot physically see one another? Thinking especially now of the one and a half million who have such severe illness or have confirmed cases of the virus already, that they must not go out. They must close the door and see no one. Perhaps too you might be at this time struggling to see God, as it were. The prayer also speaks of being fractured and made whole. Many, many people are feeling broken at this time. The owners of small businesses, the self-employed that have had to close. Some of our families might be feeling fractured, thinking particularly of those who have had to self-isolate Some even having to do that in the same house, but many having to stay in separate places or locked in because of it. And particularly, of course, we think of the heart-wrenching films of the many dedicated, self-sacrificing medical workers and frontline services that have to remain separate from their families because they are vulnerable and because the worker is constantly putting themselves at risk being in contact with people who are ill with the virus. I have begun to hear as well from other clergy the stories of broken hearts when families and priests 
may only speak to dying loved ones by phone. No sight, no touch, just utterly inadequate words. Lord, I wait until the tide turns, until the ordinary becomes strange, until the empty is presence full, until the two become one, until the ebb flows. This final stanza then talks about the ordinary becoming strange. We're in a new kind of lifestyle now, which is not ordinary at all. And we long for the things that used to be part of ordinary life to happen again. And after so long a time, the ordinary will then feel strange. Imagine when we first meet again or can touch or go into a restaurant and eat or can hug people when we greet them in the street. I hope we will appreciate the ordinary so much more. This final stanza also talks about emptiness being full. We can see on our screens whole cities empty. Shopping malls, restaurants, great tourist attractions or our own little street and see emptiness. It looks lifeless and perhaps we long for what we used to get sick of, being in crowds, being able to stand or sit close to people in auditoriums, stadiums, cinemas, We want to see shops, parks, schools full again. I'm very aware in my job that weddings are being postponed because of the difficulties of not being able to celebrate with large numbers. And this particularly stands out in the penultimate line that waits for the two to become one. And so... My heart goes out to those who planned to be married soon, but choose to wait, so two cannot become one yet. And also, of course, I think of those who have lost a spouse or partner, either before or during this epidemic so far. For the two in this circumstance has already become one and the heartbreak, the sadness, the soloness and the isolation and the deep grief that they will be feeling. Before Paul reads the poem for a final time, I will say I wanted my reflections this week to be ones that acknowledge reality without apology and that in case we don't know it, we are in fact all grieving, and that we need to recognise that, because we are all suffering losses of many aspects of our normal life, and in bereavement there is no getting back to normal, but having to find a new normal. For a while all of us, in so many countries across the world, are having to cope with a new normal. But we know that this new normal is temporary. And for certain, our circumstances here are so many times more luxurious and safe than for so many people across the world. So may we all have a new perspective and find a new grace a new gratitude and humility about our new but temporary normal. We know every tide does turn. It is high and the land is covered. At times the land is overwhelmed by the tide and then it recedes. It ebbs back 
and reveals the new landscape it has caused. Our lives individually and as a nation and as a whole world will without doubt be in a new landscape and we don't know what the future will look like. So as Paul reads this poem prayer for a third and final time, in this waiting for the tide to turn, we must place ourselves into this new normal and ask God for grace, gratitude and humility. We must hold on knowing that God is never far off and we must hope and trust that the tide will turn and we must play our part. Lord, I wait for the tide to turn until the distant becomes close, until the far off becomes near, until the outside is within, until the ebb flows. Lord, I wait for the tide to turn until weakness is made strong, until blindness turns to sight, until the fractured is made whole, until the ebb flows. Lord, I wait until the tide turns, until the ordinary becomes strange, until the empty is presence full until the two become one, until the ebb flows. <laughs>